two websites. I, this is the one that we're using instead of the current website. But this lovely site, which was created a little over a decade ago here at the University of Alberta, <coughs> remains um, very functional and has the images that we did in Jasper National Park. And Lou Carbon was here talking. I talked to Lou earlier, and he was mentioning this collection. So it's another site to go to. But if you're interested in historical um, imagery of mountain ecosystems and you want to study mountain ecosystems, this is a great resource to learn. <coughs> all right, enough of that. This is all to say that the dynamics of change are a big part of how I think we need to uh, reflect on restoration and reclamation. And these changes are being pushed, and just to rehearse this a little bit more, I mentioned a lot of this earlier, but big processes going on that's moving the planet land conversion, environmental changes, mostly climate driven. Um, but I should mention, back up for a second, <coughs> it's not just climate. Changes in, of course, the biogeochemistry, biogeochemical systems is transforming things. Calling a mine, the University of California, Riverside, Edie Allen's been doing work on looking at nitrogen deposition and its impact on, on grassland, um, native grassland restoration and has found that the nitrogen levels in the peri-urban areas is high, so high now that restoration is practically impossible. And of course, ecological changes, a lot through invasions. And finally, and this is the one that we tend not to pay attention to, I think it's very important, but the shifts in cultural value about nature. If we were to go back in that time machine to 2003, that would predate by two years the arrival of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And unless you were a real geek working inside environmental economics, you would not have heard of the notion of ecosystem services. Nowadays, ecosystem services, that notion, is so widespread that it dominates a lot of how ecologists and land managers are thinking about appropriate intervention. And that's um, it's hard to understate the significance of that change because it means that we've moved from a compositional focus in restoration to a functional focus. And maybe the pendulum swung a little bit too far, another you know, source of conversation later. So it's important to pay attention to those cultural values because they drive what? They drive our research, they drive our public policy, they drive what industry is willing to do and the social license that people give to industry. And they drive um, how a broad informed citizenry thinks about nature. Big. So they, they really can't be ignored. It's important to pay attention to. All right. So all of this work in the mountains, looking at landscape change, and thinking about these multiple drivers uh, pushed me to collaborate with a number of people who were thinking about Novel Ecosystems. And this book, truly hot off the press two weeks ago, um, is the first broad uh, scale um, integration of thinking about novel ecosystems. And so it takes a look at how we define them, some examples concerns we might have about them, challenge to eco ecological theory, and a whole host of other things. 42 chapters written by more than 50 authors, um, all pretty much collaborative. So you can imagine it was a, quite a labor of love. And there's blood spatters on a few of the pages. It's all good. Um, and it stems from a, a version of this diagram that appeared originally in a 2009 paper in Trends in Ecology and Evolution. But this is a refined version I think I like a lot better that Lauren Hallett did. And um, if you think in effect of, so ecosystem functional on one side, composition on the other, similar near the origin, moving to less similar as you push out. Toward the center, you see ecosystems that are Historical, that is to say, they have continuity of what's come in the past. We recognize them. It's the Gary Oak ecosystems back home. It's the Aspen Parkland around here. You recognize them, it makes sense to you. But as you push out, you start to get into 
you push out far enough, you cross real or apparent thresholds that prevent the ecosystem from shifting back through active intervention to historical qualities. So you get systems where, and we we're talking about one of the graduate students is focused on uh, salinized soil. Well, that's a big issue in Alberta, big issue in a lot of places. When, you, when soils are saline, it really significantly limits what can be restored and indeed what can be reclaimed on those sites. And so we start to get um, practical barriers to restoration. I think practical barriers to reclamation as well. And then there's the fun stuff, right? It's always in the middle. It's the gray zone right in here. Well, it's the light green zone. Um, the hybrid systems. So hybrid systems are those that, that aren't historical. I'll give you an example. Should have brought a photograph, but I walk uh, pretty much daily and cycle through this um, park in the middle of Victoria, not Beacon Hill, another one. And there's a chip, wood chip trail all along the perimeter of the park. It's used by hundreds of people daily. And if you look up, what you see is a canopy of Gary Oak trees, which is a native species and iconic for um, that region. But if you look at the understory, it's right around you. The only native species that's apparent is actually an invasive, it's the snowberry. Everything else is an exotic um, invasive species. Um, English ivy, uh, um, spurge laurel, um, broom. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's sort of like a who's who of invasive species in this little trail system. That's a hybrid ecosystem. It, it's possible to pull that system back to historical qualities, I think. I think. Take a lot of work, but you could do it. So I don't think it's past the threshold, and largely because it still has that functional canopy system. And you've got enough, you could probably make it work. And so this conceptual diagram, this sort of state space, really is just in, in trying to get a sense of, well, OK, we know what historical is. And this is where we've rooted a lot of our management activities with restoration in the past. We kind of get a sense of what's happening with these radical changes, where you have systems that are um, completely altered. I think that example from the Galapagos I gave at the beginning was one example. Um, I visited in the wheat belt of Western Australia last year. I was in the Jara, former Jara forests that were cut down, classic story, converted for agriculture. Um, agriculture wasn't so successful. Those lands went um, into disuse. And over a period of 60 years, um, in these now somewhat saline soils and with a lot of exotic invasive species, new forest types have formed of the kind we've never seen before. Active restoration was undertaken for about 20 years with almost no effect. Millions of dollars poured in to trying to restore these ecosystems back to Jarrah Forest with almost no success. And so we're starting to see the emergence of these novel ecosystems that's causing us to scratch our heads around what to do. And you know, we, we still have this very powerful attachment to historical systems and a belief that they're important, but how do we move forward? So here's a definition for you. But it's a system of abiotic, biotic, and social components. So the social is important. And the interactions among them that by virtue of human influence differ from those that prevailed historically, having a tendency to self-organize and manifest novel qualities in the absence of intensive human management. So this kind of a, this definition eliminates the kind of novel ecosystems that we would find in heavily cultivated areas or heavily urbanized areas. So you know you would exclude the quad, you know, here at the University of Alberta. So that's the definition that's kind of a working definition. That's why I made it look like chalk, because I'm sure this definition will shift over time. But that's where it is right now, and that's what you'll find in chapter six of this book. Now, you can imagine that a concept like novel ecosystems has stirred up a lot of controversy. Well, at least you think it would stir up a lot of controversy. 
not a lot has appeared in print. We weren't able to draw on a lot of, sort of critical, um, systematic reflections and novel ecosystems in writing the book. So we actually created our own. But in the process of doing this, several of us have been, you know, thought at times we were sort of accused of being the Darth Vader of ecology, right? Um, the dark force coming in and saying that history doesn't matter anymore. You can do whatever you want with ecosystems because it's okay now. Everything's changing so quickly. That is profoundly not the message that I want to convey. It's certainly not the message that we um, are trying to put forward in this book. In fact, the message that we're trying to put forward is that we need to proceed with, a, with particular care in terms of sorting out how we restore and reclaim ecosystems in the future because things are changing. And it's better to have your, your head you know, out of the sand and looking around, seeing what you need to do, than to have it buried. But nonetheless, um, this has been a, you know, I don't know. I don't feel so bad about being Darth Vader. And my son, who's nine, thinks it's very cool. But, uh, <laughs> so one of the questions that's emerged that a lot of people ask is, will novel ecosystems become the new normal? I don't know, perhaps. We'll see just where directional change is taking us. But if we look at misapprehensions and concerns, and we actually commissioned a chapter in the book to look at these issues, we can see a lot of them. Um, so worries, perhaps, that we might stop managing invasive species. I don't think we will. In fact, I think that we're becoming more diligent about understanding the dynamics of invasive species, and this will be, continue to be important. There's been concerns that will displace traditional conservation and restorations we embrace novel <coughs> ecosystems. I don't see that happening either. I think they're going to change, but I don't think we're going to displace them entirely. Things are certainly going to get more complicated, though. From an ecological perspective, rapidly changing ecosystems comprising new species assemblage underscores the challenges that ecology faces in the 21st century. And Thomas Homer Dixon, the Canadian pundit, writer, and scholar, wrote um, a couple of years ago that ecology will be the master science of the 21st century. And I can say this with some authority because I don't think particle physics is going to be, even though my namesake, the Higgs boson, is a big story these days. But um, I, I think ecology is going to be recognized, or is being recognized increasingly, that ecosystems are, as Frank Egler, the ecologist, once um, reported that ecosystems are not only more complex than we know, but more complex than we can know. And it's deeply humbling. I think anyone who studies ecology is humbled by that complexity. And if we, uh, but the introduction of novelty makes it more complex. It certainly make, increases complexity. There's worry as well about whether people will continue to care and there's optimistic, optimistic and pessimistic views about whether people will continue to attach to ecosystems or whether they'll let go. You know, if they're, you know, we have this view of pristine ecosystems, and if we acknowledge that more and more of them are becoming novel, will that cause us to detach or attach? I don't know. It's an open question. There's hubris, and my friend and. Um, colleague, the uh, um, Alan Thompson, philosopher at Oregon State University, <coughs> writes that a persistent concern is the separation from historical anchors that will make it easier to exercise human ambitions, and that ecosystems will increasingly resemble what humans wish them to be, efficient service providers, rather than what they would be without our intentional intervention. Ambition itself is not an objectionable characteristic of our species, connected as it is with generating many of the advances that help make modern life valued. But there is a sense in which overreaching one's proper domain, or perhaps range of authority, is objectionable. To be overconfident in one's ability to take the helm, so to speak, is one way to characterize the vice of hubris. And finally, will we fail to respect 
that which isn't us. Well, we lose a commitment to intrinsic value in ecosystems. Again, these are all concerns that we think are important to address or at least under, you know, recognize. Let me come back to this question and begin to wrap up. So what is responsible intervention in ecosystems undergoing rapid change? Well, one is to not sort of throw everything away, but to look at what our practices are now and to see how they might evolve. So this is a diagram that we prepared for a paper that's um, in review right now, looking at, um, what is it called? It's changed recently. So, um, the changing role of history in ecological restoration. And in it, we argued that Restoration 1.0 saw history as a template that viewed ecosystem trajectories as singular and emphasized composition and structure. So that was kind of, if you were to go back 10 years ago, you would, that's how you would find restoration largely described in the literature. But what we see emerging is in fact history as a guide, that there are multiple trajectories, that there's an emphasis on process as opposed um, to structure, and that there's a kind of more pragmatic um, view which sees us reflecting genuine livelihood needs. So this is particularly important. I learned this a lot through the work I did with the WCPA document, looking at the Global South and issues of poverty alleviation and ecosystem and, and ecological sustainability. So those are important. So I think it's possible to take our existing practices and modify them to produce new practices that are faithful to our intent by and large, but have a slightly sh different view of things. And I don't know what that looks like exactly for reclamation. But this is how I think about it for restoration. So if we go back to that tension, perhaps, between restoration and reclamation, do we see it as a continuum? And if we do, how do we connect these two together? I think that's a big challenge. They are presently separated. There's, for example, the Canadian Land Reclamation Association and the Alberta chapter of that, which is very active. And land reclamation people do overlap and intersect with people doing restoration and vice versa. But it's not that closely connected. I think Dr. Nath does a terrific job of trying to bring the two together. But in practice, they're quite separate. So how do we see them in relationship to one another and how do we move that? And especially, how do we see it? Um, under conditions of rapid change. So when we go back to this question of, okay, pigs, what do you do about responsible intervention? What kind of things do we need to look at, look for? In the past, we've used history as a kind of anchor. By the way, I found this photograph, isn't it great? It's an anchor graveyard. It's a place where old anchors go to die in Portugal. Fantastic. So, but I've always thought of, of history as a kind of historical knowledge, as an anchor that, that kind of tethers us. If we have to take a careful view of the past, it limits our ambitions. It provides a kind of a check, or acts if you're into diesel engines. It acts as a kind of governor on just how fast-paced that, that system can go. And I think that's been very important for us. But now in an era of rapid change, historical knowledge is shifting. I'm not sure it's becoming less important, but those kind of fixed historical references are becoming less important for us, for sure. And so we're starting to lose our anchors. Or if, for those of you who are sailors, you know that having an anchor shift along the bottom of the ocean in the middle of the night is one of the scariest things that you can experience as a sailor. So we're shifting. You know, there are sort of the what we've held on to in the past is beginning to shift. So what do we do about that? Are there new hooks we can hold on to? Are there new ways of thinking about the, the um, kind of the moral gravity that holds us down, that makes us do the right thing, that promotes responsible intervention? 
one approach, I'm just going to give you two. Um, I've actually already given you one, talking about the way in which we change from restoration 1.0 to 2.0. But I'm going to give you two more ideas, and these are very conceptual, but hopefully of value. The first emerged from a project that Alan Thompson um, <coughs> undertook, resulted in a book last year called Ethical Adaptation to Climate Change. Human Virtues of the Future, that's the subtitle, you can't see it. They were, these philosophers got together and said, what are the virtues that guide us as individuals and practitioners, in restoration in particular? And the virtues-based approach is an intriguing one, because it puts the locus of moral responsibility on individuals, and, but that there are common values that go across individuals. So as a responsible professional, if I'm a virtuous restorationist, I adhere to those virtues that are in common. What are they? Well, one of the authors in this book, Bill Throop, suggested these four. Fidelity, humility, sensitivity, self-restraint. So these are actually connected with traditional virtues. I think it's kind of intriguing. In my contribution to the book, I added a, um, a fifth one, which I said this notion of historicity, that is the quality of being historically minded, of being able to reflect on what's come in the past, is going to be a virtue in a rapidly changing world. So I think there's something here in being able to look at what does define good practice in this virtuous sense. I'll talk more about that. So a bit of an interesting tangent, but I think it's one productive way to look. And it's one that stretches across restoration and reclamation in intriguing ways. The second was a project that um, I worked on in Kootenai National Park. It was a restoration project with Rick Cubian, um, looking at trying to deal with Rocky Mountain sheep and um, uh, looking and restoring historical composition to the um, Douglas fir ecosystems on the, the bench. This is um, Radium Hot Springs, the town of Radium Hot Springs. This is, the four, this is the Red Street campground, and this is a restoration prescription that was undertaken a few years ago. But it gave me the idea while I was working on this of this idea of wild design, which I had written up a few years ago as just an initial scribble of an idea. I get to think about it more. There's, a, I think, a fruitful ambiguity in the notion that design can be, in fact, wild, that when you're working with ecosystems and intervening in them, restoring them, reclaiming them. You're always dealing with processes that are beyond your control, and in fact, that's how you want it to be. So your design is in fact dealing with design for wildness, which seems like a, you know, you know, there's an ambiguity there that I think is really productive. And so in the process of doing this, we said, well, what is wild, if you're doing wild design well, what kind of characteristics are you manifesting on the ground? And as we studied this project and worked with Rick and his colleagues, we said, well, clarity about what your intentions are and your objectives. Fidelity to the site and to what's come in the past, even if you can't represent exactly what happened in the past. Resilience. So designing both for resilience and understanding the capacity for resilience in ecosystems. Restraint. So when you have a chance to do less, and that's a, then that can be a good thing, which is a hard lesson, right? Because as a species, we tend to be rather exuberant. Respect, not only for the ecosystems, but for others around it. Responsibility, so being recognizing that your job as a restoration or as an intervener in the ecosystem carries with it significant responsibilities that carry on for a long time. Engagement, which is that profound connection that people form with ecosystems when they're involved in restoration. So those are two ideas that follow up and start to get us thinking conceptually about how we address this question of responsibility in an era of rapid change around restoration and reclamation. I'll finish with two imagery, images. This one, um, for the graduate students who visited Germany, did you get to the Ruhr Valley last year? Did you go over that? I didn't ask you about this. This is a sculpture by Richard Serra, the famous American sculptor. It's an obelisk formed of steel from reclaimed steel in the region 
and it's a t it's a top an old Thyssen Krupp um, foundry spoil pile, a spoil pile that has seen since the Second World War almost no biological growth. So this spoil pile, um, it's just everything is solarized. It's just and so when it came to systematic restoration work in the region. They did a lot of really innovative work, German style, on restoration. But at the end of the day, they had a very creative approach, which was, let's not try to restore this because I'm not sure that it can be restored. Let's actually acknowledge it symbolically and to honor it. Now, I hope that we don't do too much of this. This can be very valuable in terms of pointing out the limits of human ambition. I hope we don't do too, too much of this. What I hope we do more of symbolically is connect people to ecosystems connect them through the acts of reclamation and restoration to get them very much living with and appreciating them. This is my son, by the way. Um, this remains a favorite rock for him um, on Galliano Island. So let's hope that we'll see a lot more of this, a lot more of that kind of connection with ecosystems, even in areas that have been formerly heavily industrialized. Thank you very much.